digital tools like the IFLA Library Map of the World to communicate our value and tell our library stories. Before we get going with that, I have a couple of special people to thank, actually a whole group of people from the statistics and evaluation section. If you're in our section, you know who you are, please stand up because you helped us get here. So thank you so much, much appreciated. It takes an entire team. And one more small detail, today's a very special day. It's my birthday, and I decided to spend it with all of you this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> I am 39 again. <laughs> well, without any further ado, our first speaker. Oh, one more thing. We are, if you are, this is being streamed on, live streamed online. And if you are listening to me from afar, we are using the Mentimeter so that you can also participate and ask questions. So we're going to take a, um, a questions from the audience after all of our speakers have shared their wisdom, insights, and experience with us. And we'll also take questions from the audience. So think about those questions as you listen to each of our panelists. So without any further ado, our very first speaker is Christine Pabraza, and she is the Member Engagement Officer at IFLA. She has decades of experience. She served as a senior officer at the Cultural Culture Information Systems Center for 10 years. And in her position there, she planned, she did worked on digitization, training, public access projects. She did a lot of stuff to enable free and equitable access to information and cultural heritage in Latvia. She's worked as an impact assessment specialist for the same organization. And Christine has also taught. Um, she's taught in the library school, so I know about that. Yay! Train up all of the new librarians. So she's taught at the University of Latvia for 13 years in the Library and Information Science Department. But we're very fortunate to have Christine with us this afternoon, so please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Happy birthday. Uh, I'm, uh, by the way, 39 too. <laughs> Isn't it cool? It's a very good age, right? So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, session. And uh, I'm really delighted uh, to open this session, which uh, is uh, a very important topic and uh, was mentioned also during the opening uh, session by President, uh, who highlighted the importance of advocacy and, and uh, library map of the world and, and storytelling. So my topic uh, today is uh, on community engagement, though I will be talking about uh, stories and uh, what does it mean uh, for us uh, at IFLA and for you in your countries. So on my slide, you see the branding of the library map of the world. And this is because uh, uh, I've been working for the library map of the world since its first day. And the library map of the world is very young. It, has, it is only one year old, uh, exactly <laughs> one year old. And um, so and all that I will present and talk to you today is uh, based on our experience during the first year. So let's uh, move forward. So before I actually start to dig into the topic, I just uh, want to talk a little bit about why. And uh, what you see now on the screen uh, are those six uh, sustainable development goals uh, that will be on the agenda for the United Nations high-level political forum next year. And this is a huge, huge opportunity for us uh, to do advocacy uh, through storytelling on how libraries actually make a contribution in achieving those goals. That's why it is very important that we prepare good and we prepare for the next year and have uh, enough uh, a survey on examples how libraries actually are contributing to achieving those sustainable development goals. And that survey uh, was an inspiration for us 
at IFLA headquarters to actually include also stories as part of the library map of the world. Through that first survey, we received hundreds of stories from libraries all over the world, uh, which, which highlighted clearly the need and willingness of librarians to actually tell wider world about things that are, they are doing uh, in their countries and to show this to their stakeholders and use this uh, in their advocacy. So, and I will just go back a little bit. And uh, here on the screen, what you can see actually is the actual screenshot from the library map of the world. And you may wonder why we only have f very few areas highlighted in green color here on the map. So we have actually at the moment uh, just four stories, and I will explain you why. So what is the challenge? Uh, and this challenge actually clearly came out of the global vision discussion. And what you see on the screen uh, is very familiar for you now already. Uh, these are opportunities number three and opportunity number six from Global Vision Summary Report, right? So the challenge with storytelling for the library map of the world is one, that success is perceived differently by different stakeholders. It's perceived differently by us librarians, differently by our library users, differently by government, differently by your funders or private partners. And the challenge with storytelling for advocacy uh, through sustainable development goals is basically that we need to find a way how we can use the language of our decision makers so that they better understand what is it, that contribution, right? So, it is obvious that we need to understand our community needs better so that we actually can design those services and provide services that make sense for those communities. And when they make bigger sense, then we can also uh, demonstrate bigger, uh, bigger contribution and bigger impact. So we need to ensure that our stakeholders understand our value and impact and uh, now I will be talking about what we propose can be used as a framework for that uh, to switch our thinking from, from how we tell stories now to how we could actually better do it. So what is the main problem? And it's, uh, it is uh, a challenge all over the world in all regions and and it's the challenge that when we speak about our services, our activities, and things that we achieved in our libraries, we use what I can call library perspective. And it's not bad. We are proud of what we did, and we want to tell a wider world about the good things that happened in our libraries, right? But to really be able to use those stories in advocacy, and when you do advocacy, you talk to your decision makers and different types of stakeholders, right? We need to use the community perspective. Those decision makers, they also work with communities. And this is the common point through which we can talk in the same language. Uh, you see three questions on the screen, and I will come back to those questions through my presentation today. And these are questions why, what, and so what. So we are all very good at telling wider society about what we did in our libraries, describing how we implemented a new service or how we engaged with the new target group, which is underserved in our community. But what we sometimes lack is bigger focus of why we actually did it. And this is a more detailed explanation of your community, where your library is located, about the challenges that this community face, 
that explains why you actually have that particular service in your library, right? And another, the greatest challenge that we all have is related to demonstrating impact. And uh, impact, when I say impact, I mean, at least in the widest sense at this moment, I mean both qualitative and quantitative data and evidence that our stakeholders may want to see and may be able to connect to their agendas. So when we talk about impact, and here is what I want to say, that it is not complex. This is the simplicity in that complexity of impact measurement because there are things that we can measure in terms of quantity and quality. When we talk about impact, and this is also that we are talking with those who's, who are submitting their, their stories to the library map of the world, it all starts with knowledge and understanding. If your library is implementing a training program, you can measure how the knowledge and understanding or competences and abilities of those participating in those programs are changing. So this is simple. This would lead later into changes in their behaviors, and it's because they have a new skill. They can do things better. They can do things faster, easier, and that's, that would lead to changes in attitudes and perceptions also. But our end goal is quality of life, the changes of quality in quality of life of those people we are serving is what, is what we are looking to have described in every story that is published on the library map of the world. And this is also the, the quality of life, improvement of quality of life in our communities or on individual users is something that through which we can connect to that contribution that we are making to achieving, uh, to achieving sustainable development goals. So in blue, you see in the bottom things like education. So this quality can be changed in terms of employment. You may influence innovation and creativity in your community. You may influence health and it also will affect equality. These are just a couple of examples on the slide and we could continue with many more slides through which we, we could show that contribution. So we see therefore the community engagement is actually the key. And the community engagement from the beginning until the end. And here I want to refer back to what I found useful in my previous work in impact measurement in Latvia is uh, actually comes from Canada, from the Working Together project, uh, which has been developed already quite a while ago. If you want to Google it, you, you may find it uh, by using community-led service planning model. And this is uh, an adapted version of that. So you see the same three questions that we are looking for. Is why, what, and so what? So the first is about community assessment and needs identification. So and it actually is, consists of two parts. So we want to know what our community is all is about. So we look outside our library. We look what are other organizations who we could partner actually with, maybe who have the same goals. And then we identify the needs of those underserved or specific target groups in our community that are in need, right? And when, in, when it comes to storytelling, that we want to have that short description that explains where is this community located, who are the people living there, what are the problems people face every day. It's because when your story goes online on the library map, uh, there will be other people reading that, that from many different parts of the world. They will know nothing about your community or your library and why it does things. 
So the next step is what, which actually is the actual service development and delivery. I will not focus on that because in storytelling we don't have problem with that. But then measurement and evaluation is, is that third question that we want to have an answer to. And when we talk about the community engagement, we will not spend time for this today, but this model actually uh, involves engagement of community members and groups, not only in the first stage of community needs assessment, but also goes until the end, including planning services together with the community so that they better m meet the need and also asking after that your community members what it actually, did it make a change for them and what it means for them. Simple, right? <laughs> Here it gets uh, even more simple. <laughs> so the three same questions on your right. The actions that we talked as a framework is on your left. And in the middle is something through which we want to explain the difference between just collecting performance statistics, or for example, if you had a training program collecting how many participants were there or what was the percentage of community reached, but going beyond that. And for stories, we want to have some evidence of outcomes. So what happened to those people who learned how to use a computer in your library? or who learn how to write a CV, what happened after they left your library. This is what we are looking forward in storytelling. And this is uh, what matters to our stakeholders because that's what they are interested. They're not that much interested in details of how you made it, but what happened after that. So, therefore, we say that uh, compelling evidence-based story consists of three parts. And for the library map of the world, these are three minimum requirements for the narrative part of the story. First is community focus, then the description of what you did, which is very short, and then that description of impact on the community. So you may know that uh, we produced what we call a storytelling manual. The full title of it is Libraries and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, a storytelling manual, uh, which is really a practical guide and it's our first attempt to describe, to explain and describe those things and to help you to tell your stories better. Uh, this guide is available for download on IFOS main site as well as on the library map of the world and is organized in, in several chapters but the most important of them is actually how to tell your story. It will lead you through these three questions that I mentioned uh, which is what, why, what and so what and will help you to prepare your story so that it has those crucial elements and interesting things like a catchy title, it has a strong opening and as you know that people will not read more than two paragraphs until they get bored if it's not, didn't catch their attention yet, right? So we want to say the main things at the beginning. Effective scene setting is where we have described that context of our community and where our service fits and what is the actual contribution. A very clear narrative and the meaningful ending. And the meaningful ending is the, the, that part that talks about the impact and contribution and clearly demonstrates the relation to achieving the <coughs> sustainable development goals. So that was a short, introduction that I prepared for you today and uh, I am happy to really talk to you more about it. Uh, I will be spending a lot of time at this congress in IFLA booth which will be open today. 
And we have a couple of printouts of the storytelling manual and we prepared other materials uh, that, uh, that we can use to, to really talk through your individual cases. And uh, let's meet online as well. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Emily, Emily Plowman, and she is the project manager at the Public Library Association, or PLA, which is part of the American Library Association in the United States. She is responsible for PLA's performance measurement initiative, which is called Project Outcome. It's funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Project Outcome is a toolkit that's available to public libraries in the United States and Canada without cost and the toolkit's designed to help public libraries share the impact of essential library services and programs. So with Emily, please come to the podium. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and happy birthday. Um, thank you to the statistics and evaluation section for inviting me here to IFLA. I'm truly honored uh, to be presenting in front of all of you and meeting so many colleagues here at our session. I do want to call out that Christina and I are colleagues on the Legacy Partnership as part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding. And um, one of the requirements of the grant is that when you co-present, you wear the same color shirt. So um, I'm glad that we were able to coordinate. So as Rebecca shared, I'm the project manager for the Project Outcome Toolkit, uh, which she also shared was a free online toolkit for public libraries in the United States and Canada. And what I'm gonna talk to you today um, about will sound very similar to some of the points that Christina touched on. And what we're really trying to do is help public libraries start to measure the outcomes of programs and services. There are a number of different ways that libraries can be measuring their value, and we acknowledge that they shouldn't be getting rid of any other way to measure value. This is just one more tool that they can be using to talk about the value of their programs and services. And one of the challenges that we face, and I think is true across the globe, is that libraries really serve their community at such a granular level that they can sometimes feel challenged in thinking through how they can effectively measure outcomes in a way that's consistent either across the field, across the nation, across the globe. And what I'm really grateful for is that we at PLA had a task force that was put in place about six years ago uh, that consisted of public library staff, state library staff, and researchers from the US and Canada who came together and decided that they wanted to commit to coming up with a standardized set of outcomes that any libraries could use in the United States or Canada and be able to pick off the shelf and apply in any size library in any setting. Sounds really easy, right? Um, I present a lot uh, at state and local level conferences, and I did have a colleague one time challenge me and ask, how were we able to do this? How could she possibly do this when her library was so different, she had such limited time, and she had so many other things going on that were priorities that she wouldn't actually be able to use the toolkit that we put in place? Uh, this woman is also my mother's best friend and not afraid of being honest with me. Um, so. I've, I've really kept that in mind as I've gone around and talked about how we can actually support libraries and what libraries have been able to do using the outcomes that we've provided to them. So these are the outcomes up here, and they look very simple. We help libraries measure the outcomes of knowledge. What does a patron learn after they've attended a program or service? Did a patron gain confidence after they've attended a program or service? I attended the public library section yesterday and a Western, uh, Western Australian colleague talked about some story time measurement that she'd done and how they had captured the confidence gain from parents reading to their children. That's an outcome and we can help libraries capture those kinds of outcomes. So these are all the outcomes that we capture in a number of different ways in the standardized surveys we have in the Project Outcome Toolkit. 
As Rebecca shared, it's available for free for U.S. and public libraries. Uh, and we do have some availability to some of our resources for anybody who wants to sign up on the site. So the standardized surveys are the core foundation of what we've made available. We have a survey management tool. We have custom data reports that libraries can build if they uh, run a survey and enter the data into our system. We have interactive dashboards. And then we have a whole host of resources and training that are available uh, to anyone who registers on the account. So if you're interested in learning more about how we have put this project together, how you might be able to access some of our um, knowledge base that we've put up on our, online, feel free to create an account and you can access all of our resources and training. So again, the core foundation of what we put in place are, are really just a simple set of surveys. Uh, this is what it looks like any library, a library of one staff person, can go online, they can pull this survey off, and they can hand it out to a patron after a program concludes. It's a four uh, Likert scale set of questions that measure, again, the outcomes of knowledge, confidence, and behavior change. Uh, we also ask if patrons are more aware of library resources. And then there are two open-ended questions. What did you like most and what could the library do to improve? And the questions are customized to the survey topics that you'll see here. And these survey topics actually align really nicely with the SDGs. They don't cover all of the SDGs, but they uh, can fit within a number of the high priority ones that IFLA has in particular. And once libraries are using our surveys, they're available in English, French, and Spanish. Um, again, you as the international community could go on and actually download the paper surveys. You couldn't enter the data into the system. Uh, but once we have data collected from the US and Canadian public libraries, we can actually roll that data up and we can start looking at aggregate results. And libraries in the libraries that participate are able to benchmark against state and national averages. So let's get to the exciting part of what does this look like as practice. The key to what we put in place, the whole model that we developed and implemented in the United States was one that assumed that a library of one staff member could go online and be able to measure outcomes with the support from the toolkit. So the first example that I have up here is from Burnsville, West Virginia. And West Virginia is one of the poorest states in the United States. It's coal country. There are a lot of economic, de economic development and health challenges that are in this state. And this library has one staff person, and her library is pictured here. It's one room. Uh, and she was able to go on and pull the surveys off, and she was able to measure the outcomes of programs and services. And the very first time that she did this, uh, she actually did it for a story time. The, the library staff member, her name is Beth, um, she handed these surveys out to kids after a story time program. And she collected the data. It was for, I think, about four children who attended. You don't have to get hundreds of responses to be able to do something with your data. You just need to start collecting data is our philosophy. And because we are able to support and provide library, approach libraries in this way, she felt empowered to be able to start measuring outcomes for the first time. She handed these surveys out and the kids wrote on the surveys things like, Ronald McDonald was the best and we love pizza and more kids should come to this. This is a great program. We love it. Why can't we have more kids come? This data isn't being used by her for research. She takes it to her board and she says, this is what we're doing and these kids love this program. Can I have more funding? Can I have more support? Can the board get behind me and help me find ways to communicate this to a broader audience? And the board loves it and they give her more support. And she continues to go out and hand out surveys after programs and services. She's been doing this for about a year and a half. And what she's been able to, un what she's been able to do as one person in one small library in the middle of West Virginia is to get more funding so she can have more computers in her library. She's been able to build partnerships, after school partnerships, so she can have mentors come and help the kids that come to the library for after school learning. And she has a better understanding about the impact of her programs. It's very simple. It, it doesn't have to be something that, that is a barrier. It can help libraries improve and become more efficient. Most commonly, what we hear is that libraries will take the surveys, they'll measure the outcomes, and they'll make programming improvements. 
And programming improvements can be done very quickly, they can be done very easily, and they can be done without cost or, little, or with very little cost. So in this example here, this is out of Plano, Texas, uh, they have science kits that they check out to kids who come into the library. And um, they decided to put the surveys in the science kits and find out what patrons thought about them. And they believed that the patrons would write back and say, we want more science kits, the library should offer more, get more of them so that we can check them out more. And that was true, that definitely happened when they got the responses back. But what they also found out was that some patrons did not know that the library offered programming for children. They didn't know the library had story time. They didn't know the library had summer reading. And they, and they were patrons that were coming into the library and the library had posters about story time, they had multilingual posters about all the kids' programmings that, programming that they did. And, the, and for whatever reason, the patrons weren't seeing that marketing. And so what the library decided to, to do was create a marketing flyer about all their kids' programmings. They put it into those science kits and then let them go out the door. And 80 to 90% of those kits came back without that marketing flyer, which means all of a the sudden they're reaching more people in their community and providing more information to them about the impact that they're having. I think that's just such a really simple way to illustrate how you can use a little bit of data to increase your impact. Of course, as what Christina is doing is trying to help libraries communicate that value more. So we have libraries really commonly just taking quotes that they get out of the surveys and they put them on their board reports. This example right here is out of Atlanta Fulton Public Library System where they're quoting and taking pictures of people who are coming to programs and talking about library value. And I, when Christina talked about making sure you communicate effectively to your decision makers, this is a really great tool to use when you want to actually tell decision makers something that they might not know to ask for, but they're going to want to hear. So what libraries are finding when they're going to boards is that the boards understood there was story time, but didn't understand the value of story time. So when they're looking at why our number is decreasing, but the library is saying, but we're so critical and we're so important to the community, they now have data to back them up when they're carrying that message into their meetings. Tulsa City County decided to measure all of their story times across all of their branches. And there's a lot of data up on here, but what I really want to focus on what they did is that they went, they went and they sorted through all of the open-ended responses at the end of their survey period. And what they found was that in branches that had post-play activities, activities happening after story time, um, were, those activities were mentioned just as much as the story time itself where those activities were happening. So patrons were saying, I love story time, but I love the puzzle games afterwards. And they realized, looking at the data, that they should be offering post-play story times in all of their branches. And they went to the board, and they asked for funding, and they got it, and they could expand that programming. Again, this isn't changing the whole community all at once. It steps towards change. It's it's continuing to prove that you're making an impact and doing it at the level that libraries can achieve it. If we were to approach them and say they had to do it all at once, all at the same time with a giant study, they would have gotten overwhelmed and shut down. But what we've been able to put together allows them to move towards being more outcome-minded and move towards more community impact at the pace they're able to. Pima County, Arizona, was presenting regularly to their board about the um, outcome measurement that they were doing. And when the Career Center came to their board as well, they're a county-based system, so they have a lot of different programming within one uh, structure. Uh, when the Career Center came to ask for more money, the county board said, go to the library, because the library is doing this kind of work already. And we know it because the library has been telling us about it and telling us about the impact that they have on their community. And they were able to create a partnership, reaching more people, having deeper impact, because they had data that they were communicating with. And when we start to roll up, when we start to look at the next level up, what's actually happening in the field, there's some really cool things that are developing. So we're empowering libraries 
just to take steps forward. Take steps forward where they're collecting data and getting used to that process. Take steps forward where they're communicating data and taking action with what they have in hand. But we're seeing a shift in the mindset, which I think is really, really just I think it's so cool to hear librarians talk about how they started off measuring the programs that they had in place. We measure our story times because we always offer story time. And then they change those programs. They, they have data, they figure out how to change it, they figure out how to improve it. And so they start thinking about out the outcomes of the existing programs that, we, that they have. What are patrons learning when they come to the library? And then they take a step back further and they actually start to question what is it that we want patrons to learn before we even create programming? So we're not just gonna continue to offer the same programming that we've always offered. We actually wanna think about programming differently. We don't wanna think about the number of people we're gonna get in the, do the door. We wanna think about how we're empowering them. How are we giving them knowledge? How are we giving them confidence to go out and be better in their communities? The same with partnerships. They're sharing data with existing partners, and then they realize they can be building new partnerships with the data that they have, and then they decide to start changing the conversation around the partnerships. And the example that I love the most comes out of Charlottesville, Virginia, where the library had been going to partners for years and had been saying, let's do a partnership and we're gonna get 20 people in the door. And if 10 people showed up, the question was whether the partnership was worth it. But maybe the program itself was so impactful to the people who came. The library was struggling with these partnerships because they didn't know how to grasp that value proposition and communicate it to the partners. And so what they learned running the outcome measures that we have in place is that they needed to shift the conversation. And it needed to be about what patrons would learn when they came and attended a partnership program and not how many would attend. And that's a super simple change in vision, but it makes those partnerships so much more impactful. And it makes those discussions around what a partnership is and what a partnership means so much more valuable to the partners and to the library. And then when we look at the national level, there's definitely challenges that we face when we try and look at the data. And that's because we're allowing libraries to collect the data in a convenient sample. We're not trying to do research, we're trying to shift the mind of the field, the mindset of the field. But we can, we do have some really interesting insights into what is happening. You'll see the map up here is, is our survey activity. This is data as of yesterday. These are libraries running surveys. Every dot that's on there is a survey package that's been administered in a library. And when we look at the data across the board and we analyze the open-ended comments, no matter what program, no matter the library size, no matter if the question is what could the library do to improve and what did the library do well, patrons are asking for more. They're saying offer more advanced classes, offer these classes more frequently, I need more of this from the library. And I think that's one of the most powerful advocacy statements we have at the national level when we're going out and talking about the value of library, the value of libraries, is that there's a desire and a want for the library to continue to invest in its communities. We had third party evaluation done where we actually do see libraries shifting towards more outcome measurement activity. And the way our model is set up is that we don't, it doesn't matter if you're using our surveys or you're using our resources to start measuring outcomes. Some libraries want to do a very complex type of outcome measurement. Some libraries want to write their own outcomes and that's fine. They're using our resources to be able to learn and move forward with those activities. And when they do, when they come onto the toolkit and they're pulling any resource off, we're seeing them all shift forward towards more outcome measurement activity. So, what does it look like now for us? We've been in the field for three years. We have over 161,000 patron responses collected in our system. We have over 1,100 libraries participating in the United States and Canada. We've really got a good foundation of activity happening within the system. Um, where do we go next? And beyond just continuing to offer regular webinars and continuing to update resources in our toolkit, 
Uh, we've developed a partnership with our uh, colleagues at the um, ACRL division across the, across the hallway from us, and we're going to be developing project outcome for academic libraries for the U.S. and Canada as well. So what that means is that we have a task force in place that's doing outcomes, that's developing outcomes right now. They're being pilot tested in the field, um, and those outcomes will be implemented within the Project Outcome Toolkit, and we'll be launching them in April of next year. And then we're also continuing to explore international activities. As I shared, anybody can sign up for an account and access our resources. And um, I was talking to a Canadian colleague a few months back, and she said, I actually think your resources are one of the best things that you have on the site. Everything that we have up here is, is intended to help move someone through a process of understanding what an outcome is, accessing the surveys, collecting data, good data collection practices, understanding how to analyze data, thinking about how to take action using data. You don't want to collect a bunch of data and don't do anything with it. And then we have a ton of information up, up here about case studies of what's happening in the field. So uh, again, all of these resources are available to anybody who wants to create an account. It's free, it's all available. Um, and we have a couple hundred international uh, accounts registered within the Project Outcome Toolkit. So we know that there's definitely interest out there in um, from folks wanting to learn more about, about how they can actually do more with the project outcome uh, format. So the very first thing we have in place, is, of course, is the legacy partnership. I'm working with Christina very closely on how we can continue to support this at the international level. Um, but we're also interested in hearing from you all here at IFLA if you want to talk about training, if you want to talk about bringing on a toolkit yourself, um, if you want to be thinking about how you can do your own project uh, within your country. Um, I'm certainly here and available and happy to answer questions. I think one of the, there are so many things I love about having worked on this project, but being able to hear libraries talk about about collecting this data for the first time and making change is such an impactful, um, impactful conversation to have, especially when you have it in a town of 500, with a library staff member who's in a town of 500 people, or you're talking to someone who's from Brooklyn Public Library. Library staff of any level can access this, they can, they can collect this data, and they can do really fascinating things with it. Um, and I certainly hope that we're able to support you across the globe being able to do the same thing. Thank you. We'll do that. All right, uh, two points of information. First of all, if you are with us online, and this is for online only because the, everybody is in the audience, so I'll be able to see your hand as we look out over the stage when we get to the question and answer section. But if you are with us online, I just want to remind you to please send your questions to us. And you would go to www.minty, that's M, E -N -T as in Tom, I dot com, and use the code 382649. So we are, we are wanting to include everybody, all of us who are, who are here and all our colleagues who are online. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce two wonderful speakers from Russia. And what you need to know is that our colleagues here are, they stepped in without a beat. There was a um, something that was going on at their library that was very big, very important. Our original speakers could not make it, and they both very graciously um, said that they would, would help us out, so we're very fortunate to hear from them this afternoon. I know I'm going to mispronounce your names. I'm just going to apologize ahead of time, but you know, people do it to me all the time. They take Varga, they turn it into Vaughn, they do strange things with it, but anyway, yeah, it's Hungarian, the H is silent. All right, so let me try this. So we have, um, First, we have Svetlana Gorkhavo, and she is the director of the Rudomino Academy, all Russia 
State Library of Foreign Literature and Manager of the Professional Development Program. And we also have with us Olga Sassini. She is also from the Rudomino Academy, All Russia State Library of Foreign Literature. So we are especially fortunate to have them with us this afternoon. Please welcome them. Good afternoon. It was a great presentation, Rebecca, and happy birthday to you. And thank you, wonderful speakers who spoke before us. It was an invigorating and rewarding experience, so thank you for that. Um, dear friends, we are really honored and very excited um, to see such a great audience. Um, I keep coming to IFLA since 1994. For. So it's a long time and I'm so pleased to see this organization like getting um, uh, more vibrancy lately and like more and more people just visiting these sessions and that proves that the topic chosen today is very important to everyone. Um, so as Rebecca already mentioned, we represent here All Russia State Library for Foreign Literature, which is located in Moscow, Russia. Inside this library there is a special unit which is called Rudomina Academy, and we are trying to do all kinds of acti activities to complement uh, the official LIS schools in Russia. Uh, because uh, I don't know how um, the situation is in your countries, in our country, the official education, library and information education, not always cope with the changes happening uh, in society and in professional fields. So we're just trying to, uh, to try new uh, forms of education and provide um, this opportunity to our colleagues. We also represent here um, headquarters of uh, the section for international cooperation of the Russian Library Association. And uh, one of the priorities of the section is, of course, um, international cooperation and uh, cooperation with EFLA in the first place. So that's why we're here today. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, collecting data, using digital tools, and moving to advocacy program, how to use them for advocacy. Um, it was mentioned today that even the word success differs from country to country, from culture to culture, and from uh, part of uh, society to one part of society to the other. Uh, for us, advocacy, I mean, there is not even word, uh, a word advocacy in Russian. We need to borrow it. Because in Russia, you need to ex explain what it is. And mostly, it sounds like you need to defend your library, not promote. Yeah, and this is a mixture of something. Yeah. Uh, advocat means defender, which is, which is one part of this uh, meaning, but not everything. So advocacy uh, for us, we try to define it and define it as successful communication. So successful communication um, with people who are supervising you, who are giving you money, successful communication with your partners, uh, with your uh, patrons, first of all, people who come to the library, and even successful communication inside your own team. So now we're going to talk about this very important side of our life and how to achieve this successful communication. Again, I would like to thank IFLA separately for the great opportunities given to us, and especially recently with the Global Vision movement, I would call it movement, because it proved that everyone in the library field, regardless of the place you are in, the country you are located or live in, uh, the size of the library, the level of your position in the library, whether you are in a little small village or uh, in a large megapolis like Moscow, everyone can be heard. And this is one of the digital tools IFL is using and involving us in using that. So this is um, a great, a great, um, um, illustration of how this kind of thing can be used. Uh, another great thing that happened to us recently, our participation in library uh, map of the world, um, thanks to Christina and uh, the great, great support she's giving to us. We have, I think, two stories, nearly two stories on the map and uh, 16 in line. Um, working together with Russian libraries on collecting the stories, 
was such a great experience. This is something practical I want to share. If you start collecting stories, you communicate with your colleagues, they communicate more with people involved in the programming, this synergy and infectious, in a good sense, <laughs> um, passion is happening. Because right now, inside our country, there are several groups being formed, uh, like our university libraries want to have their own selection of success stories. Um, yesterday at our caucus, we discussed the possibility of creating a special resource for CIS countries, library stories, and so on. So this is something uh, great happening and uh, starting right now. So thank you, Ifla, for all these great tools you are providing to all of us. Another thing I would like to mention is um, um, that um, digital tools is a powerful thing. If you uh, look at how we wake up in the morning, just remember everyone, how you wake up in the morning, what do you do? To provide more information about what, what you're doing and what you want people to do. And um, again, in our country it is important if the decision makers can feel this power um, of, of the community, reaching them out because they all are going to face elections, of course. They want, they want um, to be good <laughs> in this process. So that's why it is important to, to show them um, how quickly and powerfully information provided by the libraries can be spread and how much it impacts the life of everyone. Um, now I'm going to give the floor to my uh, lovely colleague, Olga Sassina. Uh, it's her first uh, time at IFLA and first time at such a great stage, so I, I want you to support her. And we are the part of the pilot coaching program uh, I have as a part of standing committee of CPW, CPDWL, like Continuing uh, Professional De Development and Workplace Learning. So we decided that actually every person coming to IFLA for the first time a young or, or new professional should have a coach. So this is part of our coaching procedure. <laughs> so I'm giving the floor uh, to my colleague Olga Sassina to give you more information and practical information how uh, we were collecting stories and how we participated in some other programs of EFLAR using digital tools as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Svetlana. Mm -hmm. And now some words about uh, advocacy promotion in Russia. So, in 2016, uh, the Analytical Center and the Russian government uh, issued a special report uh, on the subject what Russia do for SDG implementation. And there was very, very little information about libraries. And we found this situation unfair because uh, libraries are known as active uh, participants um, in public life and public always trusted libraries like no other institution. And libraries, uh, all libraries from all over the world, uh, world they're working together uh, with people uh, to build uh, sustain and vibrant communities. And uh, we found two ways uh, to change the situation, to improve it. And the first way uh, is large scale information campaign and I'll say some words about it a little bit later. And the second solution was participation in the international advocacy program that is provided by IFLA, of course. So IFLA became our great partner in this process. So about our information campaign. Christina told us about library map of the world but there are two parts in library map of the world. Uh, the first part is statistics and the second part is SDG stories. And uh, we decided uh, to collect stories from la Russian library success stories. Uh, but to um, collect them, uh, we had to uh, make an information campaign to inform uh, the librarians what uh, uh, the library map of the world is and uh, what success story is. So, first of all, we adapted um, and translated into Russian a uh, storytelling manual that uh, was um, provided by IFLA, of course. And it encloses what SDGs are and what library can do to contribute to each goal implementation. 
and we spread uh, the information through social media and target letters to the libraries uh, of 85 Russian regions. And as a result, we received um, a lot of stories from Russian librarians. And as a result, you can see Russia on the library map of the world. Uh, but not so st all stories we receive uh, were uh, in English because not uh, all Russian librarians speak uh, English and uh, uh, our task was to translate them uh, to make it possible to read our stories uh, for all people from people for people from all over the world that's why I found it very important to publish them in English of course uh, but this is just an information campaign and we assume that uh, the problem is much more deeper and much more complicated, of course. Uh, libraries are not often considered as uh, key players in sustainable development goals implementation, and uh, I think it is connected with the fact uh, that librarians do not have special skills how to advocate and how to convince decision makers that libraries are essential partners for development. And uh, the other solution was uh, the participation in IFLA International Advocacy Program. It's uh, another project provided by IFLA. And the Russian Library Association uh, won a modest grant, uh, grant from IFLA uh, to hold two workshops in Moscow and in Tomsk. You can see these two Russian cities on the map. You can see the distance between them. So, <laughs> about the first workshop. Uh, the first workshop uh, took place in Moscow in the Library for Foreign Literature where I and Svetlana work. And uh, it, was, in the, it uh, was held within the framework of the annual Farsight session that is called Shaping uh, the Future of Libraries. And it was with the participation of uh, IVLA president, Gloria Perez Salmeron. And uh, the workshop's theme was closer, closely related to the Farsight session, and it was called UN Sustainable Development Goals plus IFLA Global Vision, Points of Growth for Modern Libraries. So during the workshop uh, and uh, brainstorming session, the participants uh, in the first workshop walked out and presented uh, their own advocacy plans contributing to the fulfillment of the UN agenda. Uh, and um, very important fact uh, that participants admitted uh, that uh, before the workshop they didn't pay uh, attention uh, to the word advocacy. And the workshop helped them to take a fresh look at the opportunities for libraries uh, uh, participation for SDGs and implementation. And um, in addition, um, Librarians learned how to present libraries' potential to decision makers and how to convince them that uh, libraries are very important partners for the development. And the second workshop was held in Tomsk. Uh, it is uh, located in West uh, Siberia. Uh, it was very important to organize uh, this workshop uh, in Siberia because, uh, as you know, large, uh, Russia is a very large country and we decided to cover as much territory as possible. So Moscow is the center of the European part, but it, it's not enough to promote the program only in central part of Russia. It's very important to promote it in whole Russia. So um, the, partic uh, the participants of the second uh, workshop examined uh, the UN um, agenda and sustainable development goals and understood how libraries can get involved into their implementation. The term advocacy was, of course, new to many of the participants, but uh, it's very important that librarians realized that uh, they had done a lot for uh, SDG implementation, but they didn't know that uh, they contribute to SDGs. So, um, after having, um, they also created their um, own projects, uh, and uh, their task was uh, to draft projects contribu con 
contributing especially to SDGs and meeting the needs of society. So their project was focused uh, upon a great variety of topics, how to attract young people to library, how to introduce a single library card, how to provide open access to information, and so on. Uh, the participants seemed enthusiastic about their work and uh, we hope that uh, they will uh, promote their proje uh, projects in the future. So, after completing uh, these two workshops, uh, there are some findings. findings. So, um, in, uh, it's very important uh, to admit that in the beginning, most librarians were vaguely familiar with the UN agenda documents. And uh, in the course of our work, most librarians came to, came to the conclusion that their libraries had long been contrib cont contributing to SDGs implementation. And, um, but they never called it so. And uh, we need to make an effort to highlight uh, the potential to decision makers that I have said libraries are very important in SDGs implementation. And of course, uh, we need uh, to work more and more and we need at least two more rounds of international advocacy program in Russia because we made workshops only in central part of Russia and in Siberia. But our dream is to organize workshops uh, in the north of Russia, for example, in Vologda and in the south of Russia, in Sochi, for example. So, and uh, I'd like to say thanks, uh, of course, to IFLA and especially to Ingrid Bonn, who is their IFLA coordinator of the International Advocacy Program. Thank you for the support. So let's work together, participate in International Advocacy Program and join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I only wanted to add one piece of information. Uh, while we're here at the Congress, you're very welcome to come and ask about what is happening in Russian libraries to our exhibition booth, right? Uh, Russian Library Association exhibition booth, C126. Please, very welcome. We are, we are ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, our next presenter could not make the journey, unfortunately, but fortunately, she put together a, a video. So Claudia Sur Surbanatu is um, going to give us in video form her overview of the success story about Code Kids from Romania. Uh, Claudia is a library expert at the Foundation Progress and a member of the executive board of the Association for Public Libraries in Romania. All right, here we go. Let's go with Code Kids. Hello, everybody. My name is Claudia Sherbanuza, and uh, I'm very sorry I'm not able to um, be there in the room with you to have this presentation, but I'm grateful for the organizer that they are making um, this um, online presentation uh, possible and so I can share with you um, a project that we are excited about and we are implementing here in Romania. The project that I'm going to talk to you about um, has been featured in um, the library map of the world um, since um, the last congress in Wroclaw and um, we were happy to be uh, on the map even though we were just a pilot, uh, the results that we um, got last year um, were beyond our expectations. And what we're trying to do in this uh, project now is to implement a vision. A vision that uh, public libraries can be um, leading actors in a movement that uh, can happen in um, our countries a movement where uh, programming becomes um, the next language that kids, um, we should encourage kids to learn. And we really believe in this, and um, so that is why we are implementing our project. Um, uh, who uh, are we? We are Progress Foundation. 
um, an NGO based in Romania with uh, more than a decade experience in working at educational, uh, in educational projects in small and rural communities. And in our work, we've been um, um, learning about the needs that exist in the country and uh, we are trying to find innovative solutions to um, bring to these communities. Part of our um, leading uh, team has been involved in uh, Biblionet, the global libraries project in Romania. Camilla Christian um, led the training team and Ovidio Anna was part, one of the trainers in the project. So we know firsthand um, what libra li libraries are uh, good at and what librarians uh, love to do. And we are excited about implementing this project together with them. Uh, our partners in Romania, besides the public libraries, are Simplon, Romania an NGO who is focused on the educational part um, curricula of ICT learning and uh, the financial support comes from Romanian American Foundation. So a little bit about our project. Uh, we are um, implementing Code Kids, a project that is trying to rewrite the future of uh, young people in uh, small and rural communities in Romania. The statistics in Romania are um, um, actually scary when you look at the numbers for kids coming from these communities. Um, in our country, 45% of young people live in um, rural areas and um, their uh, promotion rates at uh, middle school and entrance rates in high school are uh, the lowest in the country with 30% uh, of them being able to actually finish eighth grade and move on to high school. And that is um, um, a, a reality that is frightening because uh, not being able to finish their education and uh, to um, complete at least a full cycle in education uh, really limits um, the opportunities that um, these kids will have in finding a job that will pay for a decent salary for them to, um, to live in Europe. So um, we know the reality uh, and we know it from statistics, statistics but we also know it firsthand by working in these communities. And um, we also know the infrastructure um, uh, opportunities that global libraries put in, um, rural libraries. Uh, around 80% of our public libraries in Romania received computers and are providing um, free internet access on those computers throughout the country. So, but putting together the existing need with the um, opportunities of the existing infrastructure, we proposed um, public libraries throughout the country to organize coding clubs for their um, youth, for kids from 10 to 14 years of age. And the way um, our project looks currently, um, you can see on the map the green um, points are the ones where we started coding clubs this year and the blue ones are the ones that started last year and some of them now have two different um, uh, groups of young people learning and some of them um, just uh, the advanced or just the beginning group but in all uh, 61 of them we have um, opportunities we provide opportunities for young people uh, to learn to code and um, if in uh, last year in um, Protslav we were in a pilot phase this year we are happy to um, say that we are in full swing of implementing the first year of the project and that we um, have basic um, financial support for another two years in the project and we hope to um, gather around our movement more um, supporting um, really being able to have a successful implementation of these services throughout libraries uh, in um, our region. Now, um, what I think is different in our project than in um, 
libraries throughout the world that are teaching uh, programming or are supporting uh, learning to program um, activities is the fact that we are focusing uh, on small, rural and struggling communities. Our focus is to get to those who have less chances of having a computer at home or, or having internet or having um, supportive uh, communities who are encouraging them to learn. And so we are going to these communities and we are really trying to um, um, set a, a low entrance um, requirements so we just want to um, find a community where um, there's an open library or at least a librarian who is willing to open the door for kids to learn in that library uh, and within the library um, we need a minimum of three working computers or laptops with internet access it's important to have those uh, minimum requirements and really for any type of local administration to have three working computers um, with um, power and internet um, uh, that are stable, both of them, it's not um, such a high requirement. And an issue that in our community, in some of our communities can actually be um, hard to um, pass is the fact that we need to have young people in those communities, 10 to 14 years old, and we will provide a basic training um, for two of those kids that will become leaders in the club and that will um, help with um, keeping the club together and making sure the kids are um, doing their tasks and um, uh, take advantage of all the opportunities that we provide. Now, um, the way we run our clubs, we have a two-year program. The first year, um, kids get to learn to use code.org, where they create accounts and um, they um, um, do periodical assignments. It's basically doing what the platform offers. Yeah, if you don't know the platform, we, we highly recommend it. It's available in multiple languages and it's just basic programming, uh, visual programming um, uh, help for um, kids, but not only, to learn how to program. And um, what's different and why I think having a club in a library uh, holds value is that kids are on one, ha one side learning um, on their own, but on the other hand, they are making sure they are learning as a group and that everybody in the group is together and um, are doing the tasks as a team we are assuring this is happening also through uh, gamification. We introduced some um, competitions, periodical competition, where they can win prizes. But in order to participate in those competition, they need to, to start working not as individual, but as a team. And this holds a lot of value in those kind of learning contexts. And in the second year uh, of our program, um, the kids who already passed the four modules in code.org get to learn um, to do experiments and not only do them, but also talk about um, experiments and um, how they attempt to program uh, robots or uh, plan uh, program um, um, applications, mobile applications. And this is all done through tasks, periodical tasks that they need to do and they just can ask questions and we provide support together with our uh, Simplon partners to make sure they um, can do the, the tasks and not only that but we try to help them um, take uh, pride in their work. So what we also do in the second year is to organize science fairs for them and um, uh, in partnership with the regional libraries, so the kids have a place to go and present their work in, a, in an environment that's supporting. And this is um, happening um, since this year. And the last year results are, were co quite encouraging. We started with 29 clubs, and um, the kids wrote together around 1 million lines of code, which is huge. They were uh, playing on computers before um, and during the year they put in 140,000 hours of coding um, and um, so that what, they did, what they do on computers changed because of this project and more than that the libraries who are in some rural communities can um, 
be just uh, inactive or not popular, started to be both active and popular with the young population. Now for 2018, uh, our results are still, um, we're still counting our results, but um, we do have uh, 61 coding clubs throughout the country. And in those, country, in those clubs, more than 800 kids are learning <clears throat> how to program. And they're learning how um, STEM activities is um, it's not in, uh, theoretical as they learn in schools in our public education system, but can be practical. And they can bring the, that learning in their communities and use it um, in their own, um, in the benefit of their community. And um, as I was saying, we are still measuring that um, impact of our project. But what I wanted to say before um, uh, I wrap this presentation has to do with um, the importance of communicating um, in this project, in this type of project. Uh, in libraries, we tend to do um, projects with a few partners that we know, that we trust, but um, in order to have an impact, in order to start a movement, we need to be able to um, reach out to partners that we don't know, to um, contexts that we might not be familiar with, um, and it's important to have communication plans that um, are, uh, make sense and bring everybody on the same page. And that's why when you, we communicate, um, and it's the same thing I think with the library map, um, there needs to be an internal communication within the project and then an external communication to people outside the project who can uh, be our supporters or our um, uh, future partners. And so in a project like ours, for example, we have um, internal communication with the local and regional libraries and uh, the librarians there that uh, might not be familiar with programming, might not be familiar with science fairs, with what, um, what kids need to learn in order to be able to program. Um, and also with the kids within the club, with the ambassadors, with the kids that you train or with the members of the clubs that um, they just, uh, learn at the beginning of the year that they're going to learn something new, but the expectation is that they're going to learn in the same structural way, um, informal way that they do in um, school classes. And so there is, there is a need of a lot of communication to take place in order for, for them to uh, understand the freedom that such coding club in a library actually provides them and to take advantage of that. The positive part is that all this effort in communicating and the effort that we make for our project, we use uh, Facebook groups, we use Google Drive besides emails and phones. Um, so all this effort that uh, they are learning to communicate using new tools um, is beneficial. We can see that when we have parents involved in um, supporting the club, when you have local authorities getting um, on the side of the librarian and providing them support, when we have local organizations or um, businesses coming to us to say, oh, how can we help this club? Um, so even the, though the internal communication um, might seem uh, as a need for the functioning of the project, if done correctly and effectively, it can actually bring in support from outside. And besides the internal communication, of course, the external communication, um, it's important. And I'm sure in this session, you already heard about the fundraising and the importance of advocacy and presenting our project in ways that um, people will um, understand them and want to help. Uh, but um, this takes a lot of effort and it's a different part than implementing the project. It's a different energy that needs to go in, a different creativity that, it, that needs to go in, uh, but the results are um, spectacular and um, can really help projects grow from just local projects to national or even international movements. And in the external communication, one part where the map um, comes in very handy, the map of the, uh, the World Library map, is the external professional communication of good practices and of um, uh, successful new services and development efforts within our libraries. I think it's important to bring this together and allow um, people to 
share uh, with each other not only the uh, cool parts of the project but also the struggles and um, this way we can actually support each other to uh, uh, grow together uh, movements that would put libraries on the world map of um, 21st century education context. And so um, in the midst of our project, in the middle of our efforts to um, um, grow this movement, I think the way we measure success in Code Kids has to do with um, how good practices in libraries start to become the exception or the norm, not the exceptions. Uh, we are not, we don't have in Romania a few clubs that are doing uh, programming. We have 61 clubs and we're going to go over 100 clubs in, in the next couple of years of libraries that are um, putting in their services coding as um, a service that they provide regularly. And I think it's important that uh, learning can happen at the library. We still have in our cultural context the expectation that libraries are these very dusty old uh, institutions where um, new things are um, rarely happening. And if we are uh, seeing that the expectation on libraries changes, that we know that we had uh, success. And at the same time that we empower librarians to ask for support from their local authorities. That's important and it's important for librarians to be able to articulate why they are uh, uh, important in the community, how their uh, work is actually impacting the community. Uh, and we are happy to be able to support that. And for the communities themselves, the fact that STEM type of um, activities are happening in their uh, communities and that kids are learning about um, the STEM activities and are thinking about ways to bring that in their communities is a success. And the skills that kids develop in the project um, are helping them not only choose um, a better high school, but also guide their um, vision of their own future and empower them to um, choose a future that they uh, feel um, they have a fair chance of uh, having. So um, I'm going to stop here with um, the hope that um, you want to find out more about the project and you'll look us up. I would be happy to talk to you about the project um, anytime. Um, during the Congress, after the Congress, uh, online, unfortunately. But uh, I hope that we're going to get a chance to meet um, in other IFLA conferences or um, meetings around the world. And um, let's keep in touch and let's hope. Um, and I wish you um, a great conference uh, and Congress. Thank you very much. It was wonderful that Claudia could be with us virtually, so we appreciate everything that she did to make this possible, and the, I also acknowledge the help that we had from the IFLA staff. Terrific job in, in helping us uh, accomplish all of the goals. So we have one more speaker, and she is from Norway. Uh, Marianne Schede is the president of the Norwegian Library Association. She has 11 years experience as a library director, and she also is a member of the Management and Library Association section of IFLA. So please join me in welcoming Marianne. Uh, was someone helping me finding my presentation? Yeah. Yeah, you are. That's good. So am I. So are you. So let's see. If we escape out of this, then further down, I think. Further down. I think you're right. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. We did it. The Pippa Ray. I was in the bottom. Yes. Hello, everyone. And uh, happy birthday, Rebecca. I'm also 39. Not. Uh, thank you for this invitation from from you and for inviting me all the way from Norway, which is up here. So I had quite a trip. Uh, Norway is the same size as Malaysia, actually, 
but uh, in Malaysia you have 30 million inhabitants something. In Norway we have chosen to be five. We think that's enough, really. Some fun facts about Norway. Um, we are, as you see, about five million inhabitants. We are the same size as Malaysia. We are number one World Happiness Report in 2017. Just look at me, I look very happy, don't I? We, are, uh, we have a bad football team, really, really bad. We didn't make it to any world championship or Europe. Uh, the women are a bit better uh, in football. And we also introduced salmon, rush, uh, salmon sushi to Japan. We're a bit proud of that. And we ha have 674 public libraries. I just want to boast a little, brag a little, before we go further. On the top is my hometown at the west coast of Norway, just to give you an impression how beautiful it is. And uh, also the green photo you see here, that's the northern light. You have maybe heard of that, which can be seen in the wintertime in Norway. And the old Vikings, uh, they thought it was the gods from the Norse mythology riding over the sky. And it's quite exceptional and, I must say, quite beautiful. Yes, that was a little bit of fun fact about Norway. Uh, a little bit not so fun fact about uh, the Norwegian Library Association, though we are quite proud of it because we are quite old. We, we were founded in 1913. We have 13 sub-departments and seven specialized units. And we have committees like freedom of speech, committee of copyright, committee of digital access, and so on. We have one full-time elected president, that's me, I am a librarian. And we have 3,000 members, uh, among them 2,000 individual members. Might seem small, but do remember, we are a small country of uh, five millions. Uh, and we also have, uh, among these members, a public and science library. We are, we, libraries. We are uh, uh, an association for all. What we saw was that uh, uh, the libraries in Norway are used more than ever as a meeting place, as a venue for debates, uh, for uh, uh, um, writers visiting, clubs, everything. So the visits are increasing, the lendings are increasing, but the fundings, they have gone down, 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 down over a long period of time. And we were thinking, is it just that uh, it, it happens so slowly that you kind of don't notice it very much? And we have these feelings but, uh, that things were not going so well, but you cannot talk to politicians about feelings, can you? So what is in Norway is that uh, in Norway we have around 400 uh, municipalities that the countries are divided into. And there are all kinds of sizes. One municipality can have a couple of thousands inhabitants, but in, for instance, the capital of Norway in Oslo, they have, have over 600,000. But it says in the law that each municipality should have a library. And if they are not, they are breaking the law. And none of them are, in fact, breaking the law. But it doesn't say anything about the size of the library, the staff, the budget, the fundings, nothing. So we see many, should we say, strange solutions in how to deal with having a library in the community. And these communities, uh, the 400, no, not the, the municipalities, the 400 of them, they, have, they, kind of, they are governing themselves. They have responsibility for school, uh, 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 a part of the health care, roads, and so on. And these are taxpayers' money. And uh, I must say, I think I speak be on behalf of every Norwegian, that uh, I would say that we pay our taxes with pleasure. Because for us to pay tax, that is in uh, an investment in security. We have free health care, free education, up to university, everything is free. But also it is this money that the municipalities are governing themselves. So this is uh, what we saw was that we needed to give our members some um, uh, tools to use in how to show their politicians uh, uh, the state of the libraries. So 
the green circle you see, that's a, 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 an average budget of a municipality in Norway. 4% of this total budget goes to culture. And among that again, 14% out of 4% goes to libraries. And of course, uh, uh, a politicians or even us would say, but uh, healthcare is important, schools are important, of course, and we, 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 do not, um, uh, we do not doubt that. But also, we need to show them that also knowledge is important as a part of a citizen empowerment. Uh, and to use some big words, culture is important because the culture, someone said, is the heaven above our lives. So that is also uh, important to make us a complete person, a complete individual being. And in Norway, as I said, libraries have been a success story. Never so many lendings or so many visitors as now. And we have been able, I don't think only in Norway, but we have been able to change and uh, we have been the masters in using the new uh, digital um, tools. And we need to show that, and we need to show it to uh, the politicians as well. So this is me, by the way. This is an avatar that, uh, it looks like me, doesn't it? Uh, so this is an avatar that uh, um, was uh, um, made by one of our councillors. And um, I have translated what I said in Norwegian into English, as you can see, that I'm fed up of people thinking the library as a place to relax and have fun. The library are the foundation, uh, uh, libraries are the foundation of a well-functioning democracy and people must react. And when I say people, I'm talking about the inhabitants uh, uh, in the uh, municipalities. So what we did was to, uh, this, is an, this is an extract from our members, members magazine. And what we did was to give them the tools, because we are, every library in Norway is reporting every year uh, to the National Library our statistics. How many users, uh, how's the budget, how was the budget last year, uh, what are the lendings, what are the questions we are having. We are reporting basically everything. And uh, the names you can see here at the left side are names of some uh, municipalities in Norway. And what we soon found out, that when you see all these numbers, you can, you can kind of lose it a bit, right? It, 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 it becomes a bit overwhelming in a way. So what we did was that, uh, maybe in a bit of a childish way, but it, it, it worked, was that we used color codes. And you see that the red, that's the code, that's really danger. Red is the color of danger. Of, of danger. That uh, is a reduction with more than 50%. The orange was a reduction between 20 and 50 percent. And that's some of them, as you can see. And yellow is a reduction be between 0 to 20 percent. So this was easy to find out. So each uh, uh, library director in each municipality could go in and check how is my uh, municipality doing, how is my library doing, compared with the others in my county or in the rest of Norway. And <coughs> that was a very successful thing because we knew that these numbers were used a lot when they were preparing for their budgets later in the year. And what we also did was to make a suggestion to the library directors and librarians and users in how to write a letter to the newspaper. Uh, so we d kind of designed a letter where they could copy and paste and do whatever they wanted and say that, uh, in the, for instance, in the yellow circle, we say, you can find these numbers in the statistics that we have published here in the magazine from your m municipality, just put the number in. We also had the same letter online on our websites. So, and what we wanted to do was that, uh, don't get into the uh, whining trap. That is the worst thing you can do. Tell what a library can do. Tell what we have done. Tell the success stories. Because in Norway, it is like we are saying that, that libraries are very much loved. But the thing is, 
that we are sometimes loved to death. And that doesn't help us much, does it? So um, this was what we wanted to show them in how in simple ways using the numbers, use the letters, show also the instrumental effect of a library. Uh, because a politician often think as a library as a place that you have books, shelves. That's one, that's one way to see it. But that is not the modern library, at least not in Norway, and I'm sure not in other parts of the world either. A library is a meeting place, a venue, uh, we, we have this thing in Norway now, in the villages, that the post offices are disappearing, the shops are disappearing, uh, the, the meeting places are disappearing, one after the, uh, another, and people need to meet in order to have a vital community. And that is the new role for the, uh, the libraries. Not only new, it's been like that for quite some time. And also, we want our members to focus on the sides uh, of instrumental effect, like better literacy, better health, if you, can, if you can read, if you can be part of the community. You can easily uh, contribute, and we, you have empowered citizens. And to have empowered citizens isn't an investment for a municipality. Also, what we have done is to, uh, we, some of you were talking about the SDGs uh, uh, earlier on, and for most librarians in Norway, uh, SDG is like something quite distant. But we have uh, tried to tell them that it is not about something happening in the UN far away, it's something you do to contribute every day. And imagine if the libraries all over the world who maybe have a kind of certificate hanging on the wall saying, this library is a contributor to making the SDG goals become real. That would be something. That would do something for our status too. But we are not so good in kind of uh, selling ourselves as someone who is contributing to this. And we should do. Uh, we have seen that these numbers have been used a lot. And numbers and money do speak to politicians. They speak more to politicians than, uh, than saying that library is important because libraries, a library is important. It isn't enough, we have to realize that. So what we did was quite easy. Uh, um, we, um, we contacted a quite, should I say, famous stati uh, statistician in Norway who's also very into uh, libraries. And uh, uh, his name is uh, Torid Høyvik, and he was uh, teaching at the library school in, uh, in, in Oslo. And he did th uh, this for us for free. He was putting the numbers to, uh, together and making us present them in a way that was easy to grasp. And, um, well, I'm just thinking we should have done it before because it was so easy. That was about what I had to say to, in how to use numbers. I have, please contact me if you want to. I have the longest email address in the world. But still, I hope that um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to tell you about what we did. Or find me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. So. Thank you for your attention. We've covered a lot of ground, to say the least, in terms of our excellent speakers. So it's time for us to hear from you. What's on your mind in terms of the topics that we've covered or something that has stimulated your thinking as far as whether it's talk, how do you talk to politicians about money? How do you use those numbers effectively? But it is all about advocacy. So I'm gonna open the floor for questions and I'll do my best. I'm also, I wanna ask the volunteers, do you have a microphone? Yeah, so okay, great. All right, so we're all set for that. Okay, the floor is open. Let's hear from you. We've covered so much. <laughs> Oh, good, thank you. Thank you for putting the microphone there. Was the coding camp not really cool in terms of Romania? Ah, I see, yes. 
Okay. Thank Hello. you. I'm Swe uh, Elizabeth from National Library of Sweden. I really love the, the IFLA uh, library map and the stories. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, how much material do you have in progress? You had only four, four right at the moment, but how, in what pace could we expect more material coming up? Yeah, thank you. Do you hear me from here? Mm -hmm. Is this one? Okay. So thank you for asking that question. And it's a very good question. And uh, I want to tell you that um, <coughs> just uh, three weeks ago, uh, we actually celebrated the moment when we put 100 countries on the library map of the world. So the content is data, basically, mainly. But uh, tomorrow, we will launch officially the new functionality, which will be country pages. And uh, then there will be a lot more opportunities to engage. And uh, I want to also just mention that uh, all the content that goes to the library map of the world is curated by people in, in the library map of the world team. Currently, we're working uh, with 150, uh, approximately 150 contributing organizations in those countries, uh, and we are three staff members. That's why <laughs> if there is someone who, whose content is not yet online, uh, we really highly appreciate some patience at the beginning because, as I said, Library Map of the World is uh, a very young project. Mm -hmm. It's been online just for one year, and uh, we see that there is a big need for that. We had uh, more than 22,000 users during the first year, uh, and those users come from more than 180 countries. That is from more countries than the countries actually online. So we are working hard to get your content uploaded as soon as possible. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Another question? Hello. Hello. Yeah. My name is Akmal from Malaysia. I have a question to uh, Marian, about um, my question is, uh, community in Malaysia uh, much get influenced in terms of infographic in social media. Now, uh, how about Norway to perceive uh, infographic through the social media? Uh, I th am I on? Yes, you yeah, are. I think you need to repeat. I didn't quite catch what your, your, your question was. My question about uh, infographic Geography. Yeah, yeah. Infographic. Info, info, infography. Info. Yeah, infographic. So infographics are in terms of how you visualize data or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so is that okay. what you're talking okay. about? You're talking okay. about data okay. visualization from okay. a, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. And the question was about the, I didn't quite ca catch the question. You said something about the data. Uh, perceive how no Norwegians perceive the Oh, how uh, Norwegians perceive the infographics? Yeah, is that yeah, your question? Yeah, yeah. Is, 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 uh, it, I'm not sure you mean how Norwegians in general, uh, uh, their ca capacity of understanding? Yeah, something like that. Uh, well, we are, I think we are uh, in Europe, we are uh, the top users of, uh, of internet and we are top users when it comes to modern technology as, as um, uh, smartphones. So the level in Norway in general is very uh, high when it comes to uh, using the new uh, techniques. But also we have, uh, also in Norway, a digital gap between uh, between uh, the, uh, the younger and the elderly. And there are some numbers uh, that uh, are quite hard to grasp because um, <laughs> You know, if we, if we were like 10, 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, you could say easily that I don't have an email address because I don't use email. You cannot say that now because it's so embarrassing to most people. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and those are the people that the libraries are trying to, to catch because 
they could easier for, uh, before come and say that, could you help me with this? I don't have an email address, I don't have access to Facebook, uh, I don't know how to use my computer. But now we see that that is quite embarrassing to do. Uh, so we are trying to find these people and have courses for them. And uh, because I think our government has been uh, a bit too positive in, uh, in uh, how good we actually are, because there are elderly falling apart. Not falling apart, but that was the wrong English, sorry. <laughs> there, but they are some t sometimes falling apart too, because they get so despaired, because they don't have the access and they don't understand. And it causes them a great uh, uh, deal of, of pain, actually. So I don't know if that was an answer to your question, but something like that, maybe? Hope so. Thank you. Yes, please. The gentleman in the front. Uh, here comes our volunteer. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Lars Egeland. I'm, I work in a university library in, in uh, Norway. Uh, it's not really a question, more a, a comment. Um, the Norwegian government should make a white paper on student uh, quality. And uh, I talked to my rector and um, I said that, well, this report will have to, uh, to say something about libraries too. And then she said, are you really contributing to student quality? <laughs> yeah, oh. we are, I said. And as a good librarian, I went to my office and started to, to search for uh, research articles on Mm -hmm. on the topic, uh, and I found a lot, mostly from the U.S., right. um, but they were old, many of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the first interesting thing was that I found them, I got access to them because I was in a library. Mm -hmm. uh, outside the library, I wouldn't have got access to, to those research articles. Um, so I, I like the focus from the presentations here, to focus on the outcome, not mm -hmm. on what we are doing. We have for many years reported on how many visits, how many lendings, but that's exactly. not the important thing. It's the uh, uh, outcome for, for the students, for the municipalities, which is important. And if we shall stay relevant, we have to do what mm -hmm. you have done in your presentations, focus on the outcome. That's, that's well said. I could not agree more. And working in an academic library where we train, you know, new librarians and librarians to be, it really is a focus on the storytelling in, in the sense of whether it's something very straightforward that many of us who work in academic libraries do. If you're doing an instruction session in a classroom, you do a pretest, you do a post test. Did you have any kind of impact? And I think that, you know, based on what our panelists have said, and just from experience, it really is, the story is much more engaging. The numbers, well, some of us get pretty worked up about numbers, and that's great, but at the end of the day, really, as you say, the lending, the circulation rates, those things, it, that's not, that is not really the focus of what we do. It's the people and the impact. And, and the impact that we have on lives, whether it's health information or it's helping a student have better study habits or know about databases that they had no clue about and they think, oh, I'll just go get, they'll just go get some stuff off the internet, right? You know, I always say to the students, so are you working ahead or is the paper due tomorrow morning? You know, so there, there's that piece of it, depending on uh, which, you know, who you're working with. But I couldn't agree more with you in terms of the of the contribution that all types of libraries make, whether it's specialized libraries in government or public libraries, university libraries, we are important. It's very, very clear, but we have to find a way. That's why it's so exciting to have the IFLA library map of the world. And we are just in our infancy, as you say, it's just, just one, year, one year old. So we're really at the start. So we'd encourage each of you to think about what you're doing and contribute. That would be wonderful. I, another comment? over there in the back I saw the lady in the front uh, up here the lights are a little oh okay so we have one and then another okay great we have okay time for a couple more questions uh, comments I'm back again to the welcome map. back uh, yeah. uh, do you have any stories from indigenous uh, uh -huh. libraries uh, any indigenous uh, 
um, people writing their stories about libraries? Yes, thank you very much. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer actually is yes. Uh, we have stories about, in, about indigenous people, but not from them exactly, not, but not, not submitted by libraries, yes. But uh, not from themselves. Not from themselves, but submitted uh, by library who works with indigenous people. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we had another question in the back. Um, yes, I, I need my, my opera glasses or something, so the, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Shegufta. Oh, my question. The lady in the back was, was first and then you're next. Yeah, thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Shegufta. I'm from Bangladesh. And uh, I have lost my track, uh, I mean, regarding the question to whom to ask. But my question is about the partnership. Um, uh, one of the speakers has uh, sp spoken about the partnership. Um, so, so is it Project Outcome or Emily? I can't remember. But the, my question is how to attract partners to be the partner with the library? Okay, do you want to take it, Emily? Mm -hmm. You can just. Um, so I think there's a lot of informal ways that we're seeing libraries attract partners. Uh, and that's been one of the challenges I think that we have faced at the association level um, in terms of uh, doing a lot of instruction around how to set up a partnership because libraries are usually going out and what we're hearing when they're using the project outcome data is that they're getting a partner for a very specific need. So. Um, they know that they need to do a job fair and so they look for a career, a career center or they know that they want to have a partnership with the school um, but they only want to do it for summer reading in particular. So some of what we've tried to do is reach out to libraries and get a sense if, they've, if they have a formal partnership process in place. We've, we've tried to um, ask them to share that information in their presentations. Uh, we have a summer reading webinar coming up um, in, a, in the next month where we're going to try and gauge uh, any formal partnerships that have happened. Um, but I think for the most part what libraries are doing is they're, they're gathering this data and they're identifying an opportunity for a partner because patrons are asking for it. So they're saying, I want more advanced Excel classes. And the library knows they can't offer more, ex more advanced Excel classes and so they go to the community college because they know that they have that capacity. So they're uncovering partnership opportunities in the data itself because, because they can't offer maybe a specific request that comes out of the, the answers. Thank you. Thank you. And did you would you want to? Uh, yes. I also would like to add sometimes we are victims of our own limitations inside mm -hmm. us. Sometimes we are just not asking for partnership or for some beneficiary participation. We just think, why should people come and do something free of charge for us? Just ask, believe me. Uh, my library, which is called Inastranka Library for Foreign Literature, we started a new program which is called Summer at Inastranka. We managed to find people with great kind of lecture selection and music events and literary events for the whole summer. Every evening, nobody would believe it. Just sometimes <laughs> we just don't go uh, don't go and don't ask for things and there are a lot of people who could help and then of course you need to ask for people your community needs if you ask for community then community knows you need to come to the library for this and that and then businesses are getting interested because it is the audience it is the place where where they can promote things so sometimes the beginning is just go and ask mm -hmm. well said thank you thank we you have one more question the lady that yes Hello, I am from Nepal. My question goes to Krishna ma'am. If IFLA has some format or technique writing the success story relating to SDG that time. Yes, and it is the storytelling manual that I mentioned during my presentation. So I would encourage that you go to the Library Map of the World website uh, and in the about section, there is a separate subsection on stories, and you will find it there. All right. 
Well, thank you all very much. We've enjoyed having you this, um, this afternoon, spending time with us, and we... Oh, so, um, so storytelling. Is that what you're, yeah? So, yeah, what does it mean, storytelling, right? So what is storytelling? Well, it's about what we do, and it's making it engaging and making it approachable. And as you may have heard, as we've said in a lot of ways, you know, losing some of the jargon, because we speak in our own language, which is great, that library language, but the reality is that we need to be able to engage the shareholders, the politicians, and the people who are controlling the budgets to say this is why we matter and this is why libraries have the kind of impact that we have on people's lives. So, and actually, I'm going to ask our speakers to come forward. Okay, I'm being passed a note here. All right. Um, online questions? All right. Oh, this was an online question. The online question was, what does it mean, storytelling? So we have like a couple of minutes. Do each of you want to give us a snippet of what does it mean to you in terms of storytelling? Yeah? Well, storytelling is very important because it is something uh, very individual, and I would even say uh, intimate experience people want to share with you and it's always better than from my point of view it's better than any kind you're going to suggest for them this is something people would like to tell you about its concerns their life their aspirations and this uh, personal touch and passion just makes it it thrives i don't know how to explain it's some metaphysical things <laughs> happening when people are interested uh, in sharing what is important for them. So, and this is everything about your personal life, uh, in your professional life, and so on. So storytelling is great, is what I think. Okay, thank you. Marianne? Um, uh, people have a tendency to say that in every job everyone has, they also, they often say that, I meet all kinds of people in my work, but we, the librarians, we are the ones really meeting all kinds of people, especially in public libraries, because we meet people from the cradle to the grave. Uh, mm -hmm. The first little boy or girl uh, reading their first book, looking at pictures, to the old woman reading uh, at bed before sleeping, to a student needing something for his studies, to a group studying together, listening to authors, everything. We really meet all kinds of people. And I think as a librarian, the most touching stories are from all of these people telling about their lives and how, why they're using the library. So, so that is one of the proud things about be, uh, being a librarian, is that we really meet all kinds of people. We are the best at it, actually. That is a wonderful way to wrap things up. We are out of time. And I thank you all for joining us. And I would like each of our speakers to come over and say hello to me. Hi, Christine, come on, come on over. But let's, uh, let's give them a hand. wanted to so you know it's my birthday I get to do what I want to do right it's my birthday here we go one minute isn't it nice just wonderful well you need to come to Russia in Russia we are supposed to give you things not you are supposed to give us it's a deal it's a thank deal you, you oh thank you thank you Okay. And then we'll all take a bow. Thank you very much. You are most welcome. All right, join me in thanking all of our speakers and let's get a photo. All right, have a great afternoon, evening, and enjoy the rest of IFLA. Bye.